What did you see in the 2024 wellness real estate report that reflects much of the 2023 economic drivers, challenges, and trends? Well, I'm US-based, so let me just start with saying that's probably the market that I'm most familiar with. Um, as you know, the US led coming out of the COVID pandemic in terms of a RevPAR recovery and occupancy growth, um, at least in some parts of the world. And so by the time we hit 2023, we've already begun to see a normalization in trends with some slowing in the top line growth um, because of the easy comparisons that we had in 2022 with Omicron. We had a strong first quarter in 2023, and then things slowed precipitously. I think when you combine that slowing top line growth with the re-implementation of brand standards and what we've seen as elevated operating costs in the United States, either on food and beverage, particularly on labor, um, and then if we came a bit more below the line in terms of insurance and property taxes, we failed to see a lot of that strength in top line flow through to the bottom line. So to me, we're entering a phase of more normalized top line growth with continued pressure on margins. And I think that that's something that really comes through in the report where you can see certain segments having really strong um, results on a per occupied room or per available room basis. But then when it all shakes out into the bottom line, things maybe aren't as great as they seem at a first glance. What specific data points stood out for you in the 2024 Wellness Real Estate Report? Well, there were so many. Um, as you know, we're in an opportunity, we're in a time right now in the industry where things are changing very quickly. Um, and a few things that stood out to me that reflect these sort of changes first was the pullback that you see in room service and some of the softness in some of the categories, particularly with respect to F&B and on the beverage side. Um, as we see technological enhancements in terms of food delivery, we often talk on our team about amenities now needing to earn their right to exist. So it used to be that as a frequent business traveler that was on the road, maybe 100 nights a year, I would go down to the restaurant and I would order you know, a $70, $100 meal on my corporate budget because that was what was available. Now, with all of the delivery fees for room service, different ancillary charges, and with the advent of Grubhub, Uber Eats, any of these services where I can quickly order something to the hotel lobby, I think that the amenities really, again, need to earn their right to exist. And asset managers, owners, management companies need to rethink their food and beverage strategy such that they bring guests down into the amenity. They have to be visually appealing. The food has to be interesting. The beverages have to be on point. And I think without having a skilled asset manager, skilled management team, that can be very difficult to execute in an elevated cost environment. The second thing that stood out to me was the heavy seasonality that you see. Um, and again, you know, if we're talking about heavily amenitized resorts or hotels, the name of the game in generating profits from those amenities is having high capacity utilization. And when you see occupancies drop, drop off dramatically in the shoulder and off season, it says to me that some better asset management or better, more seasoned management company that can incentivize traffic through bundling or different package pricing would better utilize the overall amenity and probably enhance profits overall. 2024 Wellness Real Estate Report now includes asset class comparison, which for the first time we get to see key data on how major minor wellness categories perform in upscale, upper upscale and luxury properties. What are your observations? So I think the first thing somebody needs to consider is people own and build hotels for very different reasons. There are people that build them because they want to stay in them, a trophy asset, a vanity project. They want to invite their friends and family, maybe something very high end, very small. There are people that invest in hotels for cash flow or for diversification. They're already invested in many other forms of either retail or commercial real estate. And this is an opportunity to diversify those cash flows. But as you enter thinking about what type of hotel you want to own, 
how you want to amenitize it, what price point you want it to be positioned at, you need to understand why are you building this? Are you putting those amenities in because you want it to be flashy, you want a lot of press, you think it brings halo to your family office or your personal brand, or is it to generate a return? If it's to generate a return, then I think the report clearly highlights that most people would be better off having um, an upper upscale property with some wellness amenities rather than going completely to the high end of the spectrum, which is really going to be labor intensive, capital intensive in terms of the initial investment, require tremendous maintenance in the asset, and ultimately you're going to have to execute in terms of service at an impeccably high level. So if returns are your goal, I think analyzing the data um, by amenity and by, by price point is key to understanding really what economic returns you can expect. What do investors, developers, and operators gain from reading the Wellness Real Estate Report? Oh, I think they gain, again, understanding whether or not they're doing this out of... Um, pride or vanity or interest or experience, or if they're doing it truly just to see um, cash flow, because sometimes you can get higher cash flows out of a higher priced asset, but not necessarily a higher return. Or are they trying to maximize the return on the dollar that they're investing? The other thing that I think is important is now you guys are analyzing different geographies. And not all consumers in all geographies use the assets in the same way. And as we know, real estate is really a local business. And even an American who travels to Europe might use the amenities differently than if they were an American on a business trip in America. So I think it's important to look at some of the data that you guys are now showcasing and how that breaks down by geography. What are people focusing on in each of the regions and what did their return profiles look like? Okay, another question that I just kind of add on to what you sure. what your narrative was. Um, going if we if we look at the uh, asset class comparison, and as as we we're discussing here that the uh, major wellness category in the luxury segment seems to have you know a higher top line, mm-hmm. whereas you know, and that doesn't kind of drip through to the bottom line. Was that when we look at the lower classes, the upper upscale and uh, upscale in major, for example, we tend to see that their top line will be obviously lower, in some cases more than three times lower, but mm-hmm. yet their, you know, the GOP levels are actually higher. Sure. So mm-hmm. coming back to your comment regarding asset managers, you know, needing to be better aware of the amenities in F and B. You know, maybe this is not just F and B here. It's also in that wellness and leisure space, because it would seem to me that they're leaving money on the table. Absolutely. I mean, I think what makes an amazing asset manager, number one, of course, is access to data. Um, But number two is experience in managing assets that are similar. You wouldn't want to take somebody, and I don't want to, you know, pick on on a hotel brand, but so somebody running a McDonald's. Um, in the United States, which you would be thrilled to own a McDonald's, right? They have some of the highest cash flows per unit for an owner of any retail brand. So that would be amazing. But that person is probably not going to run your Michelin star restaurant. Um, And it could be that the profit from those two restaurants are comparable, but they require completely different skill sets, different brands, different management companies, different techniques, different asset managers. And if they were to swap um, roles, I think neither of them would be a success. So as you think about who's going to get the best yield out of these assets, you definitely want somebody that's trained in that specific um, arena. You don't want to take from a select or limited service property and try to leverage that into full scale or luxury or even upper upscale, but highly amenitized. I think they're just completely different skill sets.